Hey mushroom nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I want to talk to you today about uh, harvesting mushrooms and best practices for doing that and also how to take mushroom pictures. So uh, when you're getting interested in mycology, one of the first things that you will learn is that mushrooms are, uh, you know, not just what you will see above the surface of the ground. That may be, uh, you know, sound like a tautology because mushrooms and fungi are actually made up of a network of mycelium. So the vast majority of the organism itself is uh, a fine network of fungus as opposed to fruiting bodies and mushrooms. So, uh, you know, the uh, organism primarily resides underground and when it produces fruiting bodies, you oftentimes have a lot of different uh, sort of features and shapes that those mushrooms are formed in and come up in. And as a result of this, if you take a mushroom picture and you just kind of get a picture of everything that is, uh, you know, above the surface of the soil, you're not going to be able to get a good identification. This is a really perfect example as to why. So this is uh, one of the mushrooms in Amanita section Phylloidea. Uh, I could call this commonly a uh, destroying angel. So if I were to eat this, it would do a tremendous amount of uh, liver damage. It would be a really bad situation. And of course, the uh, most important identification feature is what is called a vulva. So this is a cup of protective tissue at the base of the mushroom. And as you can see, I had to really pop it and pry it out in order to, uh, you know, get the whole fruiting body. So that's a really good example of why you need to sort of investigate all of the different features of a mushroom and, uh, you know, pull it out of the ground, especially, you know, again, if you want it identified. If you're collecting and harvesting for food, you have a couple of options, and I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, so anyway, if you're going to take a mushroom picture and you want it identified on a forum or to show it to somebody, you're going to want to get whatever is at the base of the stem. This is usually the uh, piece of data that is missing just because people don't pick the mushroom or get a full picture of it. Uh, and so, you know, if you want to think of it like recognizing a friend, if you get a uh, picture of your buddy Matt and it's just the top of his head, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between Matt and Sam or any other number of friends that you have that have, you know, sort of a dingy whitish, uh, you know, cap in the case of mushrooms. We're, we're kind of mixing metaphors here. But anyway, if you only look at the top of the cap, you would not be able to recognize that person and or mushroom. So uh, you want a good picture of the base. You also want a picture of whatever the, uh, you know, undersurface typically of the mushroom is. So it's the fertile surface. In the case of, uh, you know, Amanita, this may be Amanita by Sporigera, but I'm going to call it a destroying angel from here on in. In the case of this destroying angel, you have a fertile surface that is gilled. Uh, so, you know, you have these little blade-like gill things and these structures uh, are basically the spore-bearing surface. And so that's where, you know, the mushroom discharges its uh, spores from. And so you want to get a picture of that. You want a picture of the base. You want a picture of whatever is on the stem. This is kind of an interesting specimen because it has been, uh, you know, torn and ragged a little bit. You also have uh, sort of the remnants of a a, uh, a veil here, so something that was protecting the uh, the tissue of this of the. Um uh, gills here, and I'm stuttering here because I'm not 100% sure. And this is a really good example of like, okay, this has some scurfy tissue on it. It could have been a veil, but it also could just be, uh, you know, again, scurfy tissue on this stem, which is going to complicate, uh, you know, my identification. And if I want to get help with it, I need to get a picture of the whole stem to kind of help me and others interpret what's going on. Uh, the more I've looked at this, the more I'm pretty convinced that actually isn't a partial veil. So it isn't a, a proper ring on the stem, which would make this potentially uh, Amanita vulvata, which is a uh, destroying angel type mushroom that does not have a ring on the stem. So, uh, you know, fertile surface, base of the stem, stem itself, if there is one. Uh, and you do want the, you know, the, the top of the cap. There are oftentimes features that are important. In the case of, uh, you know, our destroying angels, we tend to have mushrooms that are white overall. Sometimes you have scurfy, sometimes you don't. And oftentimes this cap is, you know, either pure white and uh, sort of matte finished. This is a little bit wet, but uh, if it were dry, it would definitely not be shiny. And so that, uh, you know, can oftentimes be really helpful. 
Also, the shape of the cap is oftentimes really um, important. So, you know, some mushrooms, they open up and they turn into vases. Some mushrooms open up and they just turn into umbrellas. Uh, and so, you know, whatever shape you get uh, is, is helpful. Now, I can't do this in this case because this is a solitary specimen, but if you're taking uh, pictures for IDs, it is uh, best practice to get a couple of different fruiting bodies in different stages of maturity. That also allows you to stage them all at once. So instead of having, okay, here's a shot from underneath and the gills and the base, and then I have a shot from the top, you can just get one picture with a couple of different specimens at different ages and show their different features. That being said, you're far better off, like if you just have a onesie like this, just, just take a couple of different photographs. You know, you're never gonna have somebody grump at you for posting too many photographs of a mushroom on a forum for identification, but you very well may get someone who's like, I don't know exactly what it is, I'm gonna take a guess. And they may also, you know, depending on how grouchy they inherently are, might grump at you about whether or not it has a vulva at the base. So all that being said, it's important to collect the whole specimen. So uh, the second part of this that I wanted to talk about uh, around collection is, uh, you know, best practices for uh, ecological health and fungal health. So I am a big advocate of uh, responsible and sustainable harvesting of mushrooms for food. I think it's really important for us to be also very mindful of the habitats we visit and be uh, just basically good stewards of the land anytime we're uh, visiting wild spaces. So I want to get that out of the way. Also, you know, from my personal experience, I collect uh, a, a, an amount of mushrooms to eat that I call uh, what is reasonable for civilian use, which is anything I can reasonably reasonably eat or process uh, for storage within three days. And, um, you know, I've made this mistake and I'm sure a lot of other hobbyists and, and people, you know, <laughs> over the history of humankind, ever since we've been collecting mushrooms, you have that tendency to find just the mother load and you want to collect them all. And, uh, you know, I highly encourage you to just remember that every mushroom, mushroom you collect needs to be thoroughly cleaned. It needs to be checked for bugs. It needs to be cooked or dried or something or other. So, you know, I, in the moment, can get very caught up in harvesting. The way that I slow myself down, actually, is by field cleaning really aggressively. I'm kind of anal retentive, but I absolutely love, you know, getting with a mushroom and uh, brushing it off really thoroughly before. I put it in my collecting bag. It cuts down significantly on the time that I spend at home, like messing around trying to get, you know, grit out of mushrooms. Uh, and additionally, again, it kind of slows me down. So if I find a really good patch, I only take the mushrooms I really think are pretty. And, uh, and you know, the, I think the other thing about it over time, I never really made this connection, but when I was a kid, I was super into dinosaurs like many kids are. And uh, as I got further and further into mushrooming, and taking pictures of them, I realized that uh, I was fascinated, really enjoy brushing them up like it is a paleontological site in order to get them ready for, you know, their photographs. So that was a side benefit. I didn't make the connection until recently, but I was down on my hands and knees brushing this thing off and I just... Uh, you know, watch Jurassic Park because I'm awesome. And I was like, oh, this is actually one of the reasons that I find, uh, you know, um, crawling around and brushing off my mushrooms to be so satisfying. It scratches an itch that uh, I can't do with fossils because obviously uh, there is not nearly uh, enough rock hunting that I've done in my life. Anyway, so, uh, but when it comes to, you know, harvesting and how to gather mushrooms, it is okay to collect the entire fruiting body. In the case of, like, if you're gonna identify something, you need to collect the entire fruiting body. That is absolutely critical. So, uh, you know, and for all the reasons that I just mentioned. As far as fungal health and ecology, when you collect the entire fruiting body, that's not going to be problematic for the mycelium that's the underlying organism. You can think of these as fruit, um, and if you basically, um, you know, pop the mushroom up, that is essentially the anticipated behavior that the mycelium wants. So the mycelium produces fruiting bodies so that they can be eaten, carried off, and spread the spores far and wide. Uh, as far as, you know, damage to the mycelium, there is a combined 57 years of research in two studies that compare, uh, you know, harvesting mushrooms by 
pulling them up in their entirety, so plucking them, or cutting them off at the base, which is another thing that people, uh, you know, do when they're harvesting. And there is no difference between the two of those tactics. Again, 57 years of pretty uh, rigorous research uh, indicates that, you know, again, harvesting all, harvesting none, plucking, cutting, it doesn't seem to affect fungal health uh, and patch health in the long term. And we're talking about a fairly long period of time. So, um, you know, I highly encourage people just to be mindful in general of their habitats, but not to stress themselves out about, you know, picking or disturbing mushrooms. Especially if you're not gonna like take something home and you're just gonna take some photographs of it, picking it and taking some photographs of it and then rummaging it back into the, uh, you know, the forest floor is absolutely fine. You're not going to deprive, you know, wildlife of enough food to uh, really worry about too much. At least that's my perspective and generally the perspective of uh, other experts I've discussed this topic with at uh, some length and depth. So uh, long and short, this is a, a really lovely mushroom that also is a little bit vague because of that lack of uh, ring. Again, I think I'm gonna settle on Amanita vulvata because I don't think it ever had a ring, uh, but that is provisional because maybe, maybe, maybe it did, in which case I would call it Amanita bisporagera. Uh, but either way, it would be completely contingent upon me digging up the whole darn thing, taking some photographs, staring at the gills, staring at the top. And in my particular case, yammering about how Jurassic Park and mycology are actually fundamentally linked. I hope you have a great day and uh, find plenty of mushrooms.